everybody, and welcome to another episode of AI Inside, the show where we take a look at the AI hiding inside all sorts of things, including the newsroom, which is the topic for this week's episode. I'm one of your hosts, Jason Howell, uh, still in Italy, actually, but by the magic of pre-recorded podcast, I'm here with you also at the same time, joined by Jeff Jarvis. How you doing, Jeff? I hope you think of me as you have a beautiful plate of cacio e pepe. <laughs> I think it's my duty to get some cacio e pepe while I'm Absolutely there. Absolutely. Actually, I expect uh, photo evidence of this. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I don't want to let you down. So I guess I'm going to have to do that. I, I don't may, who knows at this point, I may have eaten it already. But, and uh, every pizza, <laughs> and every pizza Lock and pasta. Minute. And oh my goodness, mm -hmm. I'm going to eat so well in Italy. Yes, Cannot you. wait. Um, but as related to this show, just real quick before we get to today's guest and uh, start talking about today's topic, which is AI in the newsroom, want to give a huge thank you to the folks behind the scenes making this show possible. That is our Patreon, uh, Patreon at patreon.com slash AI inside show. Joshua Mayer is one of our newest patrons. Joshua, thank you so much for your support. Thank you, thank you for deciding like, hey, you know what? I like what they're doing. I'm going to throw them a few bucks a month and uh, support what they're doing. And we would love to see more of you because it enables this show. Patreon.com slash AI inside show. All right. With that, let's talk about a topic that I wouldn't say that we haven't discussed this. I would say actually our earliest episodes, when we first launched, we had a lot of conversation around the impacts of artificial intelligence on journalism, on the newsroom. And actually, Jeff, you alerted me to uh, someone who you know pretty closely, Nikita Roy, who was today's guest, um, also happens to have a podcast called newsroom robots that focuses uh, almost exclusively on how artificial intelligence is impacting journalism. And Nikita, it is great to have you here today. Thank you for being with us. It's great to be here, Jason. I'm a huge fan of the podcast, so it's an honor to oh, be thank here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and, and, we, and we yours, I've had the honor of yes. being on Nikita's podcast. Nikita is brilliant. She is a real leader in journalism and AI, um, how to use it, how not to use it. But why don't you tell us about all the things you do around Newsroom Robots first, Nikita. Yeah, please. Yeah, so Newsroom Robots, as you said, is a podcast about AI and journalism. We started it last year in April. Uh, so we are just crossed our first year anniversary um, with a grant from the Harvard Innovation Labs. And in addition to that, we also now just launched Harvard, uh, our AI um, Academy, the Newsroom Robots Academy. And so this is just a place for people to just get a quick intro into ChatGPT. I launched it with another brilliant colleague of mine, Jeremy Kaplan, who writes the Wonder Tools newsletter, which is another great AI tools newsletter. Um, and so we are doing a lot of uh, courses and uh, focusing a lot on AI literacy. So this year, a lot of my work has been focused on AI literacy um, as a Knight Fellow at the International Center for Journalists and also leading the AI Journalism Lab at uh, the City University of New York. Um, so you've been tracking AI's entry into newsrooms now for more than a year. And I guess I'll start with the blunt question, who's doing it well and who's not? <laughs> The who's doing well, I have really kept my eyes on Norway. Um, and I think, Jeff, you know it. I think the Nordics are ahead um, of us. Shipstead, a huge fan of Shipstead. We had um, Ouija Media Guard was over here at your um, at, at the Common Crawl Foundation um, event that you put together, Jeff. And I had the honor of like speaking to him for like a really long time. And I was taken aback by the fact that they have already built like 30 generative AI tools to boost like productivity and efficiency in their newsroom. Um, there's this other really small newsroom uh, called iTromso. It's part of Polaris Media, which is a bigger media organization in um, in Norway as well. And they have like they just got honorable mention for one of Inma's awards over there because they built out this data journalism interface basically that every um, every day is going and scraping all of the uh, different government documents from all of the municipals and then creating summaries and then automatically ranking what might be newsworthy and alerting oh, their wow. journalists. And this is something that was probably not possible before <laughs> gen AI and everything. But now they have really over the past year 
they brought together all of their their entire team and they're a small newsroom there are about like 25 people in that newsroom so it's not something major but they again it was partnerships they partnered up with um ibm and put together and built out this tool that's now um i was speaking to the product manager and he was talking about how um they actually broke record sales um, for subscriber in, and, and hit their subscriber goals for last year. And they think a lot of that is because it's not just they're more productive and effective, efficient with their work, but they're actually producing quality journalism because they were able to produce content that they could not cover before just because they didn't have the resource for it. What kind of documents do you, do you know? Yeah, so they're all like uh, municipal documents that that's every 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 day. Um, each and every county is like putting out records and like meeting notes and like all of those different um, information about the particular county. Um, and so it's they scrape everything and then summarize it um, for people to then for their journalists to then go and investigate further. So everything from like infrastructure um, and information about it um, to just like meeting notes that I think is something that their open data is there everywhere. Um, and we just need to be able to crawl it, scrape things and be able to put it in, an, in, a, in a really well like documented database and be able to extrapolate and work on top of that. Because it's not like this information didn't exist out there already. Yeah. It, this just really seems like one of those situations, those those really great examples of working uh, smarter, not harder, right? Because, I mean, if that information is out there and the journalists are doing what they do, they're, they're going to find those information sources, they're going to synthesize, they're going to do what they do, you know, in reporting and collecting and all that kind of stuff. But if you can use an AI system... Uh, to to do a little bit of that leg work, what does that free you up to do in your job? It, yeah, it's just the, it, time and time again, examples like this just kind of blow my mind when I when I see kind of the efficiencies that AI can bring to an organization. When we get out of the the realm of oh AI is bad, you know I don't trust it or whatever. Maybe it's not good for that, but it's really good for this. It seems like it's really good, you know, at least in this example of this is the information source this is specifically what i'm looking for and when you find it let me know and that that frees me up from having to do that long form or longhand in in, in norway we'll stay on norway for a minute um i think this is all trying to have an excuse to go do the show in norway jason we all, we all <laughs> do it there. um there's a, i don't know if you've heard of it uh, uh, a company called inacode nikita um that its model uh is to enable journalists to help towns, municipalities, share their information more readily and in more useful ways. The example that they give is that if um, somebody files for a variance to build some, an addition on their house and uh, nobody responds to the variance and the hearings, but then when construction starts, the neighbors start screaming, how did I not know about this? Well, if there's a new business model available, where we in news could help the town share their own information more effectively for their benefit, citizens' benefit, and thus ours. And I think that there's ways to open up uh, using AI to do those kinds of things more efficiently. I love that idea, Jeff. And I think uh, there's so many different tools as well that are out there. And like just New York City alone, we have like 3,000 open data sets that's there. Um, and then there's just so much more information that I think as journalists, and I think that's where our role is going to be, is making sense of all of that data. And we now have the tools to do that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, in addition to like the productivity and efficiency, I find it as another superpower for journalists who probably did not have access to be able to um, make sense of such huge amounts of data because yes. you needed yes. to have the technical ability to code and do all of that. But now with like ChatGPT's code interpreter, um, and then there's this other really cool tool that I'm a huge fan of the team called Wabi AI. Um, and they are, again, uh, working with a lot of the European newsrooms. They're a European startup. And what they do is connect to all of the open data sets, um, in, especially right now they're focused on Europe in Belgium. And as soon as any of these open data sets get updated, they automatically start generating AI insights, for example. Um, and as a journalist, this is something that if you ever have to deal with these open data sets, they get 
updated regularly. And then by the time you've done your analysis, you have to go back again and get the updated data set, then do your analysis again. And there's, but this is just something that speeds up like the entire process. And I was talking to newsrooms who were actually working and using them. And they were talking about something that it would take them like a couple of days to work with your data journalist. Now a journalist is able to do that like within minutes. Um, and I think that's that's the superpower that now journalists are going to have uh, to be able to make sense of huge amounts of data. And I'm just excited by the potential of the number of stories that we'll be able to uncover because it was all like hidden behind these kinds of like um, extensive sources and data that not everybody had the ability to go and um, analyze. All right, I'm not going to let you off the hook. Who's doing it badly? Or to ask it in a more politic way, what should American and Canadian newsrooms be doing that um, they're not? AI literacy. And I, I'm i actually just really shocked when I actually see, I interview a lot of the European newsrooms right now. I'm talking to a lot of them. And everybody has an AI literacy plan in place. And it's for everybody in the newsroom. A lot of them actually started it like, back in before chat gpt even came out they are journalists who were learning everything about what deep learning was for example and what what are what's the basics of machine learning just so that they have the lingo because they know that their newsroom they have their product teams working on it and they wanted everyone to be comfortable with the lingo and then chat gpt came and then they have boosted that ai literacy and everybody has some sort of like an ai literacy plan where it's not just for how journalists can use chat gpt but like getting them to experiment with these tools and then building shared institutional knowledge and so that's one place i think we are still lacking as an industry when i see it in um north america it's still just in the hands i would say of product teams who are experimenting with it um, I go into a lot of these newsrooms and when I do workshops, between 20 to 40 percent of the room has probably never even used a tool like ChatGPT. Wow. And that shocks me. That number should be zero. Mm -hmm. If you're a journalist and if you're in a newsroom, you should have at least used a tool like ChatGPT. Just for curiosity, right? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, yeah right. just out of curiosity. So we're just like reading about tools like ChatGPT and not really experimenting with it. And most people would have tried it out when it came out in November 2022. So they have not tried out GPT-4 and now GPT-4.0, which is out there. So I am like right now, my big thing is if you have been tried ChatGPT since a year ago, go and try it out right now because the free version is giving you access to all of the premium capabilities of chat gpt that have been available for the past year so like the data analysis you can try out a custom gpt for example you can try out the latest model gpt 4.0 and you can see how different it is um and how how advanced that model is um and i think ai literacy is so important because there's a right way to use a tool and there's a wrong way to use a tool. And we will not know what the right and wrong way is until we ourselves are, are educating our teams about it and then figuring out how to use. Because every journalist, every team member, not just if you're in the editorial department, if you're in the ads department, uh, wherever you sit in the newsroom, you have your own set of expertise and experience. And when you combine that with a tool, uh, a generative AI tool, you'll really be able to unlock a lot more use cases than just one person who's figuring it out. Like there's only a certain number of use cases that I as a person can know because I have a set of, limited set of experience and expertise that is probably completely different to a photojournalist because I'm not that person. And so they would have maybe more understanding, more use cases. Um, and so I really think that we need to be focusing on how do we build institutional knowledge around AI because it's a time about upskilling an entire workforce. Does does that apprehension that you're talking about that that sounds at least the way the way you just explained it to be pretty common here in North America when we're comparing you know kind of the approach or the mentality around AI tools to places outside of the U.S. But does that apprehension come from the journalists themselves or the people who would be working with them, or is it a more institutionalized kind of uh, apprehension that's passed down to them? 
And, you know, they might feel like, well, you know, it's, this is discouraged or this is actually, you know, actively, you know, <laughs> discouraged by, by the organization. That's why I'm not going to touch it. And why, why, and why is that different here versus the other places that you're talking about? One of the main things I've noticed over here has been um, a lot of people comparing it to the pivot to video moment. <laughs> and that oh, okay. It's, it's, it's just another hype cycle. Right. Um, and everybody is going to invest in it. And just because it's the same social media companies, I would say, like a Meta and Google and Microsoft, who are also now inventing this new technology and at the forefront of it. Um, people are hesitant about that past relationship and how they got burned by it. Um, then there's so many other complex issues about the fact that um, they have been scraped and people's hard work has been scraped and was used to train this model. So not most people in the industry don't see that as um, a fair way to be using it and comp being, not being compensated for that. Um, and then there's just like a lot of those copyright concerns, which people tend to have the idea that if they are using it, it's just, it's not ethical um, and they are concerned about it. Um, and privacy remains one of the biggest issues because people just don't know if they are using these models, how it's going to be trained. A lot of them, like I even talk about how ChatGPT for Teams is there. There are this Microsoft um, Azure where you can have like enterprise level access and it's private and secure. But sometimes people are just too hesitant and I was like, like, is it really? Um, and mm. not having, not being able to trust the tech companies. And I think it's because of the past relationship that media has had with tech and being burned by it or feeling like they were like, that's just going to be, um, they're going to make themselves reliant on this technology. But I think it's a completely different thing. This is not social media. This is a transformation and it's impacting every single industry. And this is a foundational technology. This is like your emails are on Google. It's the same thing as having mm -hmm. Google Docs. You are reliant on Google as a company there, but now in addition to Google Docs and Gmail, you also are adding now Gemini as a product of theirs that they're gonna be reliant on. That's interesting, yeah. Do you have a stand um, on whether uh, using news uh, content to train models is fair use and transformative. Uh, I'll, I'll put rag and I'll put separately, but on the on the on the New York Times suit, again, it's a contrast in in views. It's litigation in the U.S. and it's collaboration in especially the Nordics, where um, Shipstead is making their own LLM and everybody's cooperating, everybody's putting it in to figure it out. The New York Times is and 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 Alden, the, the hedge fund, are suing OpenAI. Um, uh, where do you come out on that that question of fair use and and learning, training sets? Yeah, it was interesting. I was uh, I was at a uh, at a panel with media lawyers just last week at the New York State Bar Association, Oof. and it was very interesting to hear the perspective from media lawyers on this particular issue. And I've spoken to a lot of tech lawyers, and just how different both sides of the argument are. Um, but I, I have to say, as a as a technologist and somebody who's a data scientist, I see a distinction between two things that are happening with this technology. Um, and the first one is a foundational large language model, which is like if you go straight away to like GPT 3.5 and GPT 4, not using a tool like ChatGPT, but like using the core model. Um, what they have been trained to do is basically predicting the next word. And if you talk about the New York Times lawsuit, at the heart of that lawsuit is it's pointing towards an error that um, large language models tend to do. In addition to hallucination, which is one of the risks of making up information, there's also the other big risk of memorization, where they accidentally tend to uh, memorize certain pieces from their training data because they might be very uh, unique or repeated a lot in their training data. So that's one of the main issues why sometimes you say don't input private information into a large language model because they tend to sometimes remember addresses. If you put your social security number, they could remember something like that and spit that out, for example. So they tend to memorize patterns and unique information. And when you talk about the New York Times lawsuit, um, a lot of the um, exhibits over there that they were talking about where ChatGPT um, 
where GPT was able to specifically replicate information. Those were extremely unique Pulitzer Prize winning award articles. Um, and so that's a fundamental flaw of the model that researchers are actively trying to find a fix for the same way for hallucination. We're not sure if they will find. So, and I see it as trans transformational. So um, that's one, that's definitely one view. So I'm, I, 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 I get the point um, of how it can be, it, it can really impact our industry, uh, but there's a lot more to that technology and it's not meant to replace news. But at the same time, I've gone around saying that I feel like tech companies are becoming news publishers because the other side to it is what can you do with this? foundational technology. You can build something like Microsoft Bing Chat, where, or like Google's Gemini, where you are accessing the internet, scraping a particular news website, and then providing a summary about what the news is. Meta is doing this. If you go into any of their apps and you go onto like WhatsApp and you ask a certain question, they are going and scraping a particular news website and then summarizing that and producing information to that. Perplexity is doing that. I use it a lot, mm -hmm. but at the heart of it, what I'm seeing is it is going and scraping all of these news websites. I don't have any incentive and I don't usually go and double check everything. Only if I'm fact checking myself or the information over there, will I go and um, look at the uh, particular news website. So over there, there's already traffic uh, decline that's gonna happen. And I feel like because the people who actually wrote that content and now you're specifically going and summarizing that information, that is a direct link of what you're doing and you're replacing um, and you're not paying those people for their hard work. And I definitely see the deal, deals that ChatGPT is currently doing and signing is at least a good step forward because there needs to be licensing. And for publishers, if you are going to directly use their content to produce a product on top of that, but that's not what a foundational large language model does. Um, and also to the other side, if we put a lot of um, legal and legislation around a foundational large language models, it's actually gonna hurt the small mm -hmm. tech companies. It's not gonna hurt the large tech companies and we will be killing the open source community. I agree there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's so the, the deals that are being made right now, especially with open AI, uh, the Atlantic, Vox, FT, News Corp, Axel Springer. Uh, what I've argued is that those aren't actually content licensing deals at all. They're PR and lobbying deals. They're trying to say to those companies, you're big, you're powerful. If we pay you money, will you just shut up and not bother us? <laughs> and, and the vast majority of valuable news is left out of that. And mm -hmm. we've talked about this before. I've argued that the news industry should come together and create a news API. Um, the, the chances of our industry cooperating are practically nil because they never have. But Nikita, I've gotten kind of a nightmare scenario in the last few weeks where I, I don't know that chat interfaces and agent interfaces after them will take over the world, but let's just say they do. And if they do, I think we see the death of the web as a destination. Just what you just said. Uh, you can get an answer and and you don't go there. So, so what has to happen, I think, is that we need new structures of discoverability and citation and um, new business deals. But those have to be, I think, very broad deals that almost replicate the web uh, rather than these small deals with the big guys on top of the industry. And, and I wonder whether, in a way, those deals are kind of ruining it for everybody, everybody else, I should say. Yeah, that's an interesting point that you bring up. And I think um, I see, I, I think uh, I, I looked at Nick Thompson's um, when he announced the when he announced the deal and his he posted a video on LinkedIn about it, um, and I think I, I I he gave a really good insight into what the, why they're dealing with um, doing these deals and also was talking to Gabriel Brotman over at Axel Springer about like why they are why is Axel Springer doing these deals with OpenAI and from that it seems like they see tech companies is right now being the innovators of this technology and wanting to be ahead um, with them and not being against um, the innovation that's happening over there and supporting there. So, but what we're seeing is only the giant tech companies who are going to have the bargaining power um, and be able to basically strong arm deals. And I don't 
see local news companies um how how are like what local news companies are going to be able to have that same bargaining power with um with a tech giant and we are fundamentally going to miss out on that news ecosystem mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and i agree with you that i don't i don't think chat is the interface of the future because when you go into something like chat gpt and the reason why it, you have people like me who are going and helping people understand the tool is because you go into it and it's just a blank piece of like a screen with yep. a, with for you to type something in it and you don't know what you want to ask it so what's going to instead happen and i think what the news industry really needs to focus on right now is building experiences with this particular technology mm -hmm. so for example you have all of these like tech review sites and fashion articles what kind of experiences can you create for your um for your audience so for example what kind of like what tools could you add on to like i am buying something over here right now and it automatically decides instead of like affiliate marketing where you're writing an article it's automatically giving you all of these different suggestions of uh places and or like your car your table and your desk um like if you want a standing desk what type of options are there and it's creating like an entire experience for you and it's not an article and that's what i keep on talking about maybe like more visual and it's something about i think as an industry we need to just like come together and just think about what that would look like if you're if you're having like a bunch of fashion um fashion articles and you can start suggesting to people um, what kind of outfits that they should be wearing that's personalized to them. And again, it's not an article, mm -hmm. uh, but people can come and decide what they want to wear for their um, Christmas gala. Uh, and it's all of that. We're seeing a little bit of innovation over there, I would say. Um, but again, it's in that chat interface. But I'm thinking, how can we go beyond that? Because as news, we have so much of videos, images, audio, multimodal mm -hmm. AI huge right now how can we create conversational experiences um with not just the news but we're so much more than that and so what happens when you start embedding and creating those experiences with um other forms of um other forms of like distribution and not just text hmm. yeah it's interesting i mean that that really just harkens back to our episode two with um you know shipstead um Sturmer Thalo. Sven Sturmer Thalo. Sturmer Thalo. There we who, go. Who's leaving, who, by the way, is leaving the new Shipstead today, as we record this, is split up into two companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and the marketplaces, the kind of classifieds and commerce that, 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 that subsidized all this great innovation they do, is now its own company. And the news company is owned by the um, the Tinius Trust, which is like the Guardian, a, a a foundation over it. And Sven is going over to the commercial side, but there's a lot of great leaders uh, still on the news side, and a lot of great heritage from the work of people right. like him. Right, and the kind of that legacy. But yeah, mm -hmm. Sven talked a lot about exactly what you're talking about. It, it, not just being a news site that presents the 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 text, the information. But figuring out how you use this new technology to, it almost makes it more of like an interactive kind of experience as a user I, or as a reader. I no, no longer go solely because there's an article there that I want to read, but how can I tap into the collective knowledge that that particular organization has curated and crafted over time and collected you know into this gigantic uh database that we can tap into to get much more value um does that does does that approach encourage the create like the continued creation of content the way it is or does that encourage a new type of creation does that make sense a new way in which we'll create content i think so and we'll have to because I think Gen AI fundamentally is a user experience revolution. That's what it is. It's changed the way you can talk to data. It's changed the way you can talk to tons of information. And you can it, the chat experience has evolved. You can talk to it. Um, it can understand your environment, as we have seen with the latest demos from both Google and GPT-40. It's it's the ability to in real time process information and be able to give you feedback at the end and talk to you about that particular information from video, from audio, images, and text. 
And I think that means that we need to evolve not just as um, a news on, on, a, on a website. And I think we haven't evolved from the print era. We just put a newspaper mm -hmm. online on the web. Mm -hmm. If you go to any of the news sites, that's what it looks like. Um, yeah. And how can we now change that, especially when we know the younger audience are addicted to the way the videos, the short form videos, they really like that. They like the TikTok scrolling. They like YouTube shots. Um, so how can we bring in all of those different forms of video content and at the same time make things more personalized? As you're saying, there's so much of information that news companies are putting out over there. How can we now start personalizing on a deeper level to every single individual? Um, and how can we now not just have it as a, a place where you are going and getting your information and that's like it's more of you receiving it but it's like you're interacting with that information mm -hmm. so if you for example are not you're unhappy with a particular a particular um news story that's out there people people tend to have emotions around that maybe you can have a conversation around it with your news site you know for example and then you can go deeper and then it knows information about where you're living and that oh that you're traveling a lot and um and for me if it's like if i'm like going i'm currently in florida and i'm coming over here it's like automatically it knows and if i trust my news company and i'm okay with like sharing data about what i'm doing or where i'm going it can start to personalize experiences with me and for me and so that's where i think we need to start looking into how can we are already building trust with audience how do we build trust so that we can now um, use that to help personalize experiences for people if i get a better experience with my news app because they are now going to meet my need by um safely using information about how and where i'm going or like what type of things i'm doing what types of things i'm interested in when my garbage pickup schedule list, for example, and all of those like information that you need, it just gives you an interactivity to be able to build on top of that. And so I think there are like new experiences that we need to be thinking about that. If I'm walking down the street over here and I've never been in Tampa before, I can just open up my news uh, app and like scan the buildings that are around me. And it tells me because all of the different things that must have happened in that particular area, there's so much of history at every single intersection, maybe that news that has been done in the previous um, years that the local news company over here has been reporting on. And I can, at a glance, walking through, get a history of all of the different things that have been happening down the road. And, or maybe there was like last week, something in something monumental happened at this intersection and I never knew about it because I'm just here for the first time. So like all of those different, different ways in which we can start to create experiences because that's what's going to build subscribers as well. Uh, because in a, in a time where a lot of different people are going to be um, able to create a news website, as we have been seeing, um, people, anybody can actually spin up a news website and call themselves news if they're just going and scraping from somewhere else and rewriting that. And then what is differentiating you as a company? Um, so I think that's where I'm really, really excited about the potential because it's going to give us a moment to really change the way news is delivered and consumed. I think it's a great question, Jason. I, I think uh, we're so used to the story form. We we decide what the story is. We write. We're the we're the storytellers. We're the narrators. We decide what goes in it. We could end up creating a lot more experiences, as Nikita said. I think we could create more databases of information. Uh, we can create more dialogue among uh, members of the public. Um, dialogue with documents and with meetings and so on. I think I think there's a whole a whole raft of ways we can look at at news and what communities need uh, differently. Uh, however, recognizing that the tools will screw up. Just today, I was going over, this is going to age me terribly, I was going over Medicare uh, forms with my wife, and, and I needed to find out how many how many numerals or letters there are in a Medicare number. Okay, simple question. I ask, the first thing I see at Google is 12. And then I look below, that was the uh, AI answer from Google. The actual answer was 11. Uh, we know these things are going to screw up. We know they should be kept away from news. In, in creating news on their own. They can be very valuable for lots of things, but but perilous in other ways. Nikita, I'm, I'm wondering whether, because you, you talk to different companies uh, most every week and you see a lot of interesting stuff going on. Do you have some uh, uh, companies and their work that may be of interest to our audience? 
I really find it very interesting the way in which people are building out tools right now and the approach with which people are thinking through AI product management. And I think one um, company which would be very interesting to look at is Epen Media over in Germany. Um, mm -hmm. He's just left Alessandro Albiani, but they had uh, he was the AI product manager over there. And I really liked the way in which they were experimenting with AI and bridging the product team and the editorial team together. Um, so they would do like two week internships where there, somebody from the editorial team would be like pitching products to the product team and they would bring them over for two weeks and they would be completely embedded in the product team. They would not have any of their responsibilities day to day that they were assigned. And then they would be seeing how the product is being built. And within two weeks, they would try to build a prototype of that particular product that the particular person from the editorial side of the newsroom had as an idea. So they have actually built out multiple different products, one of which was, again, on the app. They have a version where you can either read the entire story or click a button and just get a summary of that of the news stories and then go from there. So I think like, how are we changing the way in which news is being um, consumed and how can we get to those experiences is by getting editorial and product folks together to start thinking through because the expertise is in the editorial side of the newsroom of like the experience of like how to create great news stories and how to find that and what the audience needs. And the product team is bringing in all of these technical experiences, expertise, and trying to see how to bridge the gap with what the newsroom, what could be of better value to the audience. So um, they were definitely um, one of the people that I think um, have been very, very interesting to look at. How about some interesting startups? Um, Wabi AI for sure has been a very interesting startup um, to look at. Um, as I had spoken at the beginning about the data journalism um, analysis that they do with uh, automatically with AI and open source, by far one of the biggest startups. Um, Noda is the other um, interesting startup that I've been looking at because um, I find it very, I, I keep on talking about, we need to go from a lot more videos and doing short form videos. And that's something that Noda with their tool allows you to do. Yeah, you can create videos from it. You can create a newsletter, social, everything from just a particular um, AI, like from a text and AI converts that into a video that people can then go and edit. Um, and you can help with your newsletters and your social media posts. So I find them um, really, really interesting. And then for people who just want to get a start into AI, um, one of the main things that almost most of the newsroom that I've spoken to have something for headline and SEO. So if you're a big newsroom, you've either built it in-house, or if you're not a big newsroom and you are maybe a small local newsroom, I, a lot of newsrooms are using this tool called Yesio. Um, it's a free Slack-based um, AI tool. And it was developed by a fellow um, from the Reynolds Journalism Institute. And so it's it's free. And over 400 local newsrooms have downloaded in their Slack workspace and they use it to generate SEO and headline summaries. So I think that's also another, um, another great tool um, and app for people to at least get started with AI if they're nervous about it and scared about it. This is one thing that's being used a lot. So um, I would say these are definitely some of the tools that um, and startups that I've been um, looking at. Um, looking at. Um, and there's also another uh, very interesting startup that I've recently been um, getting, getting into a bit more. Um, it's called Satchel AI. And what they do is they, um, they plug into all of the city council meetings, for example, and then automatically take the transcript, generate that into a news, web, news story that you can then go and edit and um, go from there and be able to publish on your site. And so they take all that process and I was talking about, there's so much of data out there. So how can we take like all of the city council meetings and automatically start to put that out to people um, and get people to get that as news articles in front of people. And so I think this is also another interesting one that I have been, um, I've been interested in looking at. One, one thing that comes to mind for me as we've been talking about all the ways in which kind of the the journalistic uh, organizations can change is that that's really just kind of half of the half of the challenge is, you know, 
how the organization integrates or figures out these really innovative ways to use AI, how they get over the fear factor of, oh, well, we're not supposed to use that for this, that, or whatever reason. The other half of the challenge is what the people who are looking for news, what their habits are, what they feel comfortable with. And I guess the the thing that came to mind in the last you know few minutes as we've been talking about this is the approach for integrating you know a, a, an organization's data set into a new kind of way to present this and make it a little more interactive like that will work for some but for other people it's gonna be like no i don't want things to change i want things to stay the same and that seems and and actually that's built upon as you would know especially jeff <laughs> that's built upon many 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 decades of you know kind of reinforced you know uh, uh tradition and standards and and all that kind of stuff how how can this kind of evolution continue to take place when people are so dang ingrained uh you know it's they're so kind of used to doing it the way it has been and getting their news the way they have been yeah i think it's a i think wake up call for the entire industry because as we're seeing newsrooms are shrinking uh we are a lot of newsrooms are feeling threatened by the large language models and generative ai search taking over um, and I think it's it's a matter of time for us to just understand that this technology is transformational and it's not just affecting the news industry, it's affecting every single industry. We're reporting on it. Mm -hmm. um, we know how it's affecting. And so if we don't step up, um, it's going it's going to it's going to not be great for our business. And if you're running, if a newsroom leader is running a particular, uh, like a newsroom, it, it is, I would say, it is an existential threat to a newsroom. I don't think it's an existential threat to news. It's an existential threat to newsrooms mm -hmm. that do not innovate mm -hmm. right now. Um, and before we even get into AI, you're talking about data. And I think it's very important to highlight this. All of this functions if you have a good uh, database to start from. Your yeah. data is the fuel of any AI model, of any AI powered experience that I'm talking about. And it's a whole different form of data. So a lot of the newsrooms um, that I'm talking to right now, like you have, they're thinking about how to effectively manage and store news because in order to power all of these AI database, AI experiences, you need to create something called a vector database, which is a different form of storing information than how it is stored right now. Um, and being able to build them and create them, it is expensive, it's expensive to host, and um, how can we efficiently store so much of news data in these sort of new databases, retrieve information from it, and build experiences with it? There's a lot of costs involved in that. There's a lot of experimentation currently going on in terms of what's the right way to use these databases. So it's not just a new AI. The engineers on your team are working with a completely new set of way in which to store data as well in order to build these sort of like information ecosystems and AI powered uh, information experience, information ex experiences. So I think we have to, that's where also right now a lot of the innovation needs to be and a lot of the focus needs to be um, on building and getting top tech talent into the news industry, which is tough because we are competing with a lot of the other the tech uh, tech platforms uh, but i know a lot of people want to work in news as well and i think we need to appropriately compensate and um, get them into the news industry because that's how we will be able to create um, great experiences with ai but but are we at the point we, you know we jensen wong has said the university should stop training uh computer scientists um and uh, someone in one of our early shows said that, you know, the, the, the great line that English is the most powerful programming language on earth today. We hope more languages soon. The uh, point is human languages. Do we need tech talent or do we need, uh, are these tools getting so easy to, to use that what we need is what you're doing, which is training more of the newsroom and how to build the things with the tools that already exist? So I think there are two layers to that. Um, and I think you you need foundational tech talent. Like I, when I'm talking about tech talent, I'm talking about getting AI engineers and do people who are doing really cool AI research into news and getting them to help with the news industry in order to progress 
um, AI, we need that tech talent. Um, computer science, I think, is evolving, right? Um, and I think uh, Sal Khan had come on your show earlier and he was talking about this as well. Like computer science is sort of like, like was a new uh, major that had come out. Um, and so it's something that changes a lot. And I did a degree in data science and most of what I learned is honestly outdated in a way, like all of the tools and technologies that I learned is outdated because new things have come out and we are learning as it goes And the entire industry is the entire tech industry has to constantly learn because the technology keeps changing so quickly. So tech folks are usually used to the sort of like rapid change in the industry. What I think is now needed is getting those AI research folks to do the fundamental level of building a new infrastructure for news, a new data infrastructure for news, because that's where also the crucial mm -hmm. uh, changes. It's in order to build AI systems, you need to have a new data infrastructure. And that's only possible by people who are doing that sort of research. And we have some people who are already doing great work. And we have like people like Nick Diokopoulos over at Northwestern University who with this computational journalism lab over there um, has some really great students working on stuff, but we need a lot more. Um, you, when you don't, when you say you don't need, English is the like universal coding language. Now I agree with that. Even though I am somebody who has studied coding, I actually go to chat GPT a lot of the times and get it to write my, I get it to write my code and I get it to write my code in different, different languages that I'm also not so familiar with, but I have the basics of coding and building, um, building apps that I can now understand what's happening behind the scenes and then be able to create that. So I think you need to have people who have the foundational knowledge, but yes, you can get a lot more people to do stuff that they couldn't do because of the capabilities um, of generative AI. So you can do a lot, a lot of those data analysis tasks that I was talking about, but before it ever goes to publishing, you need somebody who knows the code who can go and fact check through that entire thing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's, you need those, you, you still need that talent. And in order to build the next level experiences, that's going to come also by getting those tech talents to be able to push the way and create those experiences and push the boundaries there. But I'm really hopeful that I think we might see a lot of people getting into coding as a result because the barrier to coding has lowered tremendously. Um, if you get stuck, the biggest thing with anything in code is that you get stuck the first few times when you're learning. It's really, really challenging. But now, because of tools like ChatGPT, it can walk you through all of the errors that you're facing and walk you through creating and getting the basic steps of how to code. So I'm really hopeful that we will see a lot more people trying out and getting into code and hopefully a lot more women in um, engineering. Amen, sister. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Indeed. Well, and you're, you're talking about uh, ChatGPT a lot. I should also point out, folks should definitely check out the latest episode of uh, newsroom robots podcast where you dive into kind of the as you say the potential of custom gpts uh in the newsroom very interesting uh stuff uh, i was listening to that and i thought you know that i think we're going to see a lot more of this not just in newsrooms like right as as we as we continue to understand kind of the value of of i have this data set how can i put it to work in a way that's very useful um, we're going to see this not just newsrooms, but everywhere else. So newsroomrobots.com is the site for Nikita's podcast. And then I think while you're also there, you can also check out the Academy. There's a little link to take you to the Newsroom Robots Academy that Nikita mentioned a little bit earlier. Nikita, this has been really fun. Thank you so much for for letting us turn the table on you because you, you are a podcaster. It's always interesting, right? When <laughs> we have the opportunity to have the tables turned and we become the guest instead of the host. <laughs> yeah, this was this was a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Any it's anything good, else know. that you want to throw in there as far as pe people who want to follow the work you're doing? Obviously, they have the the podcast and the academy. Is there anything else you want them to know? Yeah, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn um, okay. and on Twitter um, by, Nikita, by Nikita Roy. And so, um, yeah, I'm always on the lookout for very great, interesting work happening in AI. And so feel free to let me know about that. Excellent. All right, folks should do that. And thank you, Nikita. Really a nice pleasure to talk thank with you, you today. And uh, yeah, we'll talk to you soon. Best of luck with the podcast. Thank you, <laughs> thank you again. 
All right. And that is it. Uh, Jeff, we have reached the end of this episode. Gutenberg parenthesis.com, I think, for for you, sir. Yep. That works. That does the trick. That does the trick. There we go. So people can take a look at your your handiwork magazine and the Gutenberg parenthesis. Thank you so much, sir. And if yeah. anyone uh, wants to get the new Spanish version, it is out. Uh, oh, from, that's uh, a really wonderful job. Wow. Uh, with, with illustrations galore in here, really nicely done from the Spanish publisher in Colombia. No kidding. Uh, that so is a very catching uh, cover. It's a beautiful cover, yeah. Yeah, beautiful cover. Excellent. Great work. Um, as for this show, we normally do the show every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. On And if you wanted to catch it live, normally, I should say, with an asterisk, uh, you would go to the Texploder YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at Texploder. But of course, I am in Italy right now. So these are all pre-records. I think it's the first episode in July is our first return back to live episodes. So you know, put that on your mental radar. And uh, if you miss the live version and you get it in podcast, hey, that's the way the most that most people do because we publish the show to the podcast feed later that day anyways. Be sure to like, rate, review, subscribe, wherever you happen to listen. Also, as I've said, support us on Patreon uh, so we can continue doing this work uh, with you. Patreon.com slash AI Inside Show. Tons of perks. I'll let you go there and look at them. But one of the uh, big perks that I like to highlight is the executive producers of this show. They give a little bit extra. And so as a result, I call them out at the end of the episode. Dr. Do, Jeffrey Maricini, and W. WPVM 103.7 in Asheville, North Carolina. Thank you so much for helping us do this show each and every week. Um, everything you need to know about what we do can be found at AIinside.show. Thank you much, everybody. We'll see you next time on another episode of AI Inside. Take care, y'all.